All right, well, this morning <clears throat> I'm going to uh, read the passage we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks. I think you'll see that the length of the text is, is definitely too long to deal with in uh, one sermon. So what I'm going to focus on this morning is simply uh, what it is that Jesus is talking about here, because if we don't understand that, we're really not going to know how to interpret the details and how to apply them. So let me begin by reading <clears throat> the passage, and it's about 33, 34 verses long, so it will take me just a couple of minutes. Luke 21, verses 5 through verse 38. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you were looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Then he continued by saying to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes and in various places plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay hands, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name, yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives." But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth dismay among nations. In perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, Men fainting from fear and the expectations of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on your guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of all the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And then these two concluding verses, now during the day he was teaching in the temple, but at evening he would go out and spend the night on the mount that is called Olivet. And all the people would get up early in the morning to come to him in the temple to listen to him. Now, as I've said, this is a rather lengthy text, so 
what we're going to focus on this morning will be the time frames that Jesus is speaking of here. Now, this morning, I think you understand our passage appears to bring us to a very important topic, uh, that of uh, eschatology, which is a fancy word for saying uh, what the Lord tells us is going to happen in the future, and I think more particularly around the time of Jesus coming again, what we call the, the last things, the final things. Now, it appears to bring us to this topic, but that isn't necessarily the case. Now, not surprisingly, the church is divided over when what Jesus is talking about here would actually take place. Certainly, some, perhaps most, believe that he's speaking mainly about the future, and I mean that from our perspective. Uh, from the perspective of the disciples, he certainly is talking about the future. But what about from our perspective? Well, others believe, from our perspective, that he's mainly talking about the past. Now, as we think about the importance of this passage, one thing we need to bear in mind is that it's not critical. When I say critical, I mean crucial. That, you know, what we believe about this passage, because whatever view we happen to take, it isn't going to affect our salvation. It's not going to affect our justification. Good, you know, Christians believe different things regarding this passage. It is not foundational to the gospel. It's not like uh, the importance of believing the Bible to be God's Word. And, of course, recognizing it as our standard of what we are to believe, you know, what is true, what is false, what is right, is what, and what is wrong. It's not as critical as trusting in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation to make us right with God uh, or, of course, our need to love Him and to believe what He says and follow what He says in His Word. We don't have to take, you know, one position or another on this topic in order to see heaven, so it's not critical to our you know, well, what's most important to us, which is our justification. But on the other hand, we do need to see that it still, it still does matter. You know, just because a particular truth isn't necessary to our being Christians, that doesn't mean that it isn't important for our well-being. It does matter what we believe on secondary and even third-level issues. It makes a difference in, in how we live. I mean, think about this particular text. Should we be looking for what Jesus warns us about here? Should we be preparing ourselves to go through this? Uh, many Christians believe we should. Or do we not need to be concerned about this particular topic or this particular subject because it has already taken place? Well, that, that's the question. And that's really <clears throat> the question we want to look at this morning. Because the passage is so long and we're not going to be able to cover everything in one sermon, this morning I'd like us to begin just breaking ground by considering whether Jesus says anything in our text that gives us some indication whether He's speaking about the future or the past. Again, we do need to settle that question before we can understand what it is He's talking about. So first of all, we need to see uh, this. I think that whatever the time frame Jesus was definitely talking about an event that would directly affect the Jews. I don't think there's any question about that. Luke tells us at the beginning of this section that there were some, and, and from the Gospels we know that this was some of the disciples, were talking to Jesus <clears throat> about the beauty of the temple. Well, Jesus then said in response to them in, in verse 6, as for these things which you were looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. Now, the first thing I want to draw our attention to is clearly Jesus here is talking about the temple, and he's talking about the fact that it's going to be torn down. In other words, he's talking about the destruction of the temple that was then standing in Jerusalem. And, I, and the emphasis here is on the word then, okay, that particular temple. Now, Jesus has already warned the Jews about God's judgments uh, on at least two occasions by this point. 
In the parable of the fig tree, which Luke doesn't tell us about, but it is in Mark's gospel, and in that of the vineyard, which I've already quoted um, in our meditation this morning. Now, Mark tells us that after Jesus entered into Jerusalem, when he was presenting himself as king, that on that particular day he looked around and then he left for Bethany because it was already late. In the morning when he was returning, he was hungry and he saw a fig tree in the distance and he went to see if that fig tree had any fruit. But when he found none, he cursed the tree and then continued to the city. The next day when he and the disciples were again passing by that tree, the disciples noticed that the tree had withered from the roots up. Now on that particular occasion, Jesus used this to teach them and to teach us about the kind of answers that we can expect from the Lord if we will simply believe His promises and take hold of them in prayer. We don't want to miss that important lesson the fig tree has to, um, to teach us. We do need to trust the Lord. We need to believe Him. We need to exercise that faith and pray. We certainly need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for those that don't know the Lord. We need to pray that His will would be done. But Jesus also meant that cursing of the fig tree to be a warning of what was about to happen to Israel. You know, I don't think I need to re remind us that uh, this, oftentimes the fig tree is used as an image of uh, Israel. And certainly in another text that we've already looked at in Luke's gospel, in Luke 13, verses 6 through 9, it is used specifically for Israel about how a man had come to this fig tree for several years looking for fruit, and he had not found any. In the same way, God had come to his people Israel for many years hoping to find fruit, hoping to find godliness, hoping to find those serving him to advance his cause. You know, Matthew likens Israel in the days of Jesus as a people sitting in darkness before the light that Jesus Christ dawns on them. So God comes to them, but even after coming to them all these years with his prophets, uh, he, find, he doesn't find what he desires. And they were close to being cursed, as the man said to the tender of the fig tree, after he says, you know, let it alone, let me put some fertilizer in it, and if it doesn't bear any fruit, then take it out. Uh, that's exactly what the Lord had done. He had left it alone, but now the time has come to remove Israel. Remember what Jesus says about the branches in him that do not bear fruit. The Father prunes them, and they're gathered, and they're cast into the fire. How does one know whether one belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ or not, it's by this fruit. What is it that God came to Israel looking for? Fruit. What is it that he didn't find that was bringing the curse upon them? It was, of course, the fruit, the fruit of the work of his Holy Spirit, which was not present among them. So this was an image of the fact that their fruitlessness was going to bring God's curse upon them. Jesus then explained this a bit more fully in the parable of the vineyard. This was his indictment against the leaders of Israel First of all, for their mistreatment of God's prophets whom he had sent to Israel to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard, uh, to try to get them to turn from their sins and to, to encourage them to follow God's word and to do what it is that God was calling them to do. It was also an indictment that he had sent his son to them and they were going to reject him, kill him, and throw him out of the vineyard. The whole point of this is that God was about to destroy these vine growers and give the vineyard to others, to those who would bear the fruit that God was looking for. Essentially, what Jesus is telling us in this text is he was going to tear down the Old Testament temple, and he was going to build a new one, a new temple made with living stones. He was building the New Testament church, a, a church that was empowered by his Holy Spirit so that they would be able to bring forth the fruit he desires, which is the advancement of his kingdom here on earth. And essentially by his judgment upon Israel, this was going to be the beginning of the father's promise to vanquish everyone who opposes his son. Remember what we saw recently in Luke's gospel, David writes in the Psalms, in, in Luke, well, quoted in Luke 20 by Jesus, verses 42 and 43, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
Think about what we read in Psalm 2, that the rulers of the people, the kings of the earth, could not keep Jesus from coming to the throne. And now that he is in the throne, uh, you know, the throne of God and ruler over all the earth, the Father says, ask of me, and I will give you all the nations for your inheritance. Well, that's essentially the Great Commission, isn't it? And then there's that warning uh, to the people to do homage to the Son, lest he become angry and and his wrath be kindled, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying is going to happen to Israel because they did not submit to him. His wrath would be kindled, and uh, he would destroy them. But now the real question is, when is this going to happen? When is the temple going to be torn down? When is this judgment coming? Um, We do know that it was still future from the disciples' perspective, but the question is, is it still future for us? Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are differing views. And the most popular view is that of what's called dispensationalism. Uh, the, the belief that God basically is dealing with mankind through differing dispensations, I think a total of seven throughout the history of the world. This is the position most evangelical churches hold today. And they believe that what Jesus is talking about here is still primarily in the future from our perspective. Now, they believe that Jesus may have begun by talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. I don't think they have any question about that. But in their opinion, he quickly moves beyond that to the time of the Great Tribulation, which in their opinion is still in our future. The Bible Knowledge Commentary, which is an exposition of the Scriptures by the faculty of Dallas Theological Seminary, which is a dispensational institution, sees this shift between speaking about the temple then and what's going to happen in the future come as early as verse 11, where Jesus begins to talk of earthquakes and plagues and signs in the heavens. In their view, this just doesn't seem to fit between Jesus' ministry and the fall of Jerusalem. But they, in their opinion, these things do fit in the Great Tribulation. Now, again, from their perspective, their their order of um, events that are going to take place that that are yet future from us is they believe that Jesus is first going to come, uh, again, uh, descend from heaven with with the, the, the shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and we certainly believe that's going to happen, but they believe that's going to happen when it does. He's going to raise only the dead believers, rapture only those believers who are still alive, and he's going to take them to heaven. And then he's going to turn to deal with Israel and the whole world and and what they would call the seven-year tribulation, which they believe is the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, which they see as not having yet been fulfilled. And the great tribulation is then the second half of that seven years, the second half of that 70th week of Daniel. Now, the interesting thing is we might agree that Jesus actually is here talking about the great tribulation. But we may disagree, I would certainly disagree, on when that actually was going to take place from Jesus' perspective and when it's taken place from ours. And again, we'll, we'll look at that in just a few moments. So again, the, the first point is that there are those who look at this text saying that Jesus begins by talking about the earthly temple, but then he moves quickly to a time perspective still future from, from us. Well, another view is that uh, which is very common within our denomination, the the view of amillennialism. And I have to say that there's no monolithic view in any of these particular camps. There are variations. But I think the main ideas are these. They likewise see this passage as referring to the past, 70 AD. But they also see it as referring to the future, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, although this could get a little bit technical. In, in the view of the amillennialists, the second coming of Christ is not the same as that rapture I just referred to. Uh, it is and it isn't. It's not how the dispensationalists views it, but they believe that that coming of Christ with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the raising of the dead, that is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but it's not viewed the same way by the dispensationalists. Now, they see these events as being so similar, 70 AD and the second coming, that Jesus either begins with one and slides then into the other at some point, like the dispensationalists, as I've just described, or that he's really speaking about both events, a double fulfillment. You know, in the same way that um, Isaiah, the Lord said through Isaiah, you know, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a, 
the son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. And before the child is old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, the two kings that you fear will be basically done away with. Well, that prophecy had fulfillment in Isaiah's day to the king to whom it was spoken, but it was also referring to Jesus Christ. So there's a double fulfillment. In the same way, they see perhaps a double fulfillment in this passage. It's talking about the past, but it's also talking about the future because of the similarity between 70 AD, God's judgment on Israel, and the final judgment when Jesus Christ comes again in the second coming. But, of course, there's still one more camp, and we always save the best for last, don't we? <laughs> that sees this passage as referring exclusively to the past, to the Lord's judgment in 70 AD. Now, that, um, that particular position is, is within, usually within the reform camp, and it's called partial or moderate preterism, okay, preterism. Now, preterism comes from a Latin word, praetor, which means past or beyond. In other words, we're already past or beyond these events. They took place in the past. The word partial or moderate is added because there is a view that basically says all, all prophecy has been fulfilled, the second coming has already taken place, the, uh, the, we're in the eternal state. Uh, believe it or not, there, there are people who say that. I don't mean to be offensive, but I think it's somewhat of an odd position, okay? So it's partial or moderate distinguishes this view from that view because moderate preterism still sees the second coming of Christ being future and the eternal state, of course, the final judgment, all of that still ahead of us. Now the question we need to ask is, are there any indicators in our passage that would lead us to one conclusion or another with regard to these varying views? Well, I think there are, and I think the first thing we should consider is the question that Jesus was answering in this chapter, okay? After he says in verse 6, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down, which he was in that statement referring to the temple that was standing at that time, the disciples asked this question in verse 7, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Uh, in other words, the disciples are asking this question. When will this temple be torn down? What are the signs we should be looking for that this or these things are about to happen? Uh, we should notice, first of all, that they weren't asking about a temple that would supposedly, and again I say supposedly because we disagree with the dispensationalists that there's going to be a future rebuilding of the temple. They weren't asking a question about a temple that was going to be rebuilt over 2,000 years in the future. Okay? They knew nothing about any such temple. Now, their questions alone should be enough to point us to the correct time frame because those are the questions that Jesus was answering. When is this temple going to be torn down? What are the signs that it's about to take place? Now, secondly, we should also consider the audience. That's very important. To whom was Jesus speaking? To whom was Jesus giving direction? Well, I think the answer is clear. He was speaking to his disciples. And why was he speaking to them? It's because the events that he was referring to were actually going to take place in their lifetime and they were going to affect them. They needed to be watching. They needed to look for the signs and know it was about to take place. Notice uh, in verse 8, and by the way, we could go through this whole passage and point out numerous examples, but let me give you a few. He says in verse 8, See to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. In other words, you know, you. He's speaking to them. You do not go after them. He says in verse 9, when you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. Again, Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples. And in verses 12 through 13, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you and delivering, uh, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake, 
it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. Now, if you were just simply reading through this text, what, what impression would you get from the second person personal pronouns? You, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. Now, as we work our way through this passage, we will see that what Jesus is warning them about here actually did take place. And again, verse 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Jesus was telling his disciples what was going to happen to them, okay? He wasn't speaking about events thousands of years beyond their lifetime. Now, I think this final indicator kind of sums it all up. And that's what Jesus says in verse 32. And again, I'm not saying that, that these passages aren't disputed by our brethren who hold to the other positions, particularly in the dispensational camp. Uh, but I think it's, it is quite clear. Verse 32, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, the Greek word genea, which is the word from which we get the trans, you know, this translation, this word generation. Uh, like most words in different languages can be translated in a few different ways. We call that the semantic range of a word, right? The word green does not always refer to the color green. Sometimes it can mean novice. Sometimes it can mean money. Uh, you know, it, it can refer to several different things. And the same thing is true of this word here. Now, dispensationalists believe that it should be translated people or race. And they would see, see this passage translated this way. This people, the Jews, will not pass away as a distinct people group until all these things take place. And they would point, of course, to the miraculous preservation of the Jewish people. They're still a distinct people group even to this day, whereas many people groups in the history of the world have basically blended with others. They're still distinct as the fulfillment of God's promise in this passage. Now, certainly that's a possibility, but I don't think it's very likely, especially because of what Jesus, had, the way he's been using the terms, this generation, throughout the gospel, okay? He's been using it to refer to the Jews that were living at that particular time, the generation that heard him teach, the generation that saw his miracles. Now, Jesus really had a lot to say about that generation. Let me give you a few examples, and these, I believe, all come from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 11, verses 29 through 32. Listen to what Jesus says. This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now notice, it was that generation, those who lived in Jesus' day, that wanted the sign. They were the ones who heard someone wiser than Solomon, someone who was preaching more powerfully than Jonah. It was against them that the Queen of the South and the men of Nineveh would stand up at the judgment. Jesus was using this generation to refer to that group that was living in those days. Here's another example. Jesus says in Luke 17, verses 24 through 25, for just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in His day. But first, He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Now again, it was that generation, the Jews who were living at that time, that rejected Him and turned Him over to suffer and die at the hands of the Romans, not that race of people, 
not just the Jews in general, the people, the Jews who were living at that time. And perhaps most importantly, again, as he says in chapter 11, verses 49 through 51, a passage which is parallel to the scripture we read earlier, which introduces us to the Olivet Discourse, where he's talking about the same thing. He says this, For this reason also the wisdom of God said, <clears throat> I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Now again, to whom did Jesus send? The prophets and the apostles. To the Jews of that day. They were the ones who persecuted and killed them. And so Jesus is going to charge the blood of all the righteous to them. That is what 70 AD is all about. And that is why it was so severe. And why Jesus also said that nothing has ever befallen a people greater than this or never would again. And as we actually think about 70 AD and what took place in those days, it was horrible. Uh, horrible suffering for those people, and there hasn't really been anything quite like it since those days. Now, notice that Jesus made this indictment, the one we read in Luke 21, uh, against the Jews in 30 A.D. I mean, Jesus was crucified in 30 A.D., which means he wasn't born at zero. He was born really 3 B.C., okay? That generation, for the most part, was still living okay, in 70 A.D. They had not passed off the scene. Now, Jesus said they would not entirely pass away until the things that he had spoken of here had taken place. This generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. And he says in parallel passage, all these things, referring to the things he was talking about in our passage. Now, if that's true, that means that those things have already taken place. Now, again, that's going to be important for us to understand what it is that he's talking about in our text. If we try to interpret them as future, we're going to be missing the mark. But if we look back into the past to see how they were fulfilled, we will, I think, understand what he's saying. Jesus is talking about the vineyard being taken away from Israel and being given to basically the New Testament church, given to us. We are the new Israel. We are the people of God. We are those that are the, uh, well, the, the covenant tree represented in Romans chapter 11. We are the Gentiles grafted into Israel's covenants uh, contrary to nature, along with those few believing Jews. This is God's plan, the church, for this age, and this is how the kingdom of heaven moves forward. Well, the question we need to ask now is this. If, if these things are basically referring to events that took place in the past, then, then what do they really say to us today? What do these things mean for us? And by the way, some people would criticize an interpretation of this passage as being completely in the past as saying, well, you know, where's the relevance for it for us then? Why did Jesus say it? Well, we need to understand that the Bible does talk about things that were future from their perspective, that were fulfilled in the past, and that doesn't mean they don't have relevance for us just because they're fulfilled, okay, that shouldn't have any bearing on this at all. There's always a lesson that we can learn, even from fulfilled prophecy. So what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, I think we can learn that Jesus certainly is who he claimed to be. I mean, let's, let's note that, that, you know, if what he was predicting actually came to pass, you know, the, the predicting the future, it means that he's a true prophet. It means he was sent from God. It means that we can believe what Jesus tells us in his word. Well, what, what he tells us, of course, is this, that he is the Son of God, and he is the only way of salvation. You know, he is the door. We have to come through him. We have to trust in Him. It also tells us that um, what He claims to be the will of God and the ways of God are truly God's ways. So we need to listen to Him as He speaks to us through His Word. So first of all, we need to trust in Jesus to be saved. 
And we do need to follow His Word. We do need to pick up our crosses. We need to lay down our lives. We need to follow Him. That isn't an option for the believer. That is what it means to be a believer. Well, secondly, it means that since what Jesus speaks about in our passage has already been fulfilled around the time of 70 A.D., and certainly through 70 A.D., that we're not going to have to go through this. And so we don't really need to be on, on the lookout for it, right? We don't need to prepare ourselves to endure it. This was His judgment upon the Jews for their rejecting Him. So this does not have direct relevance to us. But on the other hand, it means thirdly that He does take His word very seriously. Okay, He said He was going to do this to Israel for their sins. And that's exactly what He did. Now, our Lord also tells us that, that there is a day that's coming when He's going to gather everyone together for the final judgment. And we need to understand that He is also serious about that day. And we do need to get ready for that. And of course, the only way we can is by trusting in Jesus and making sure that we are surrendering to Him and living according to His Word. And by the way, this also means that we need to take what Jesus said to us seriously as well in the Great Commission to get the message out to others so that they can also get ready for the coming judgment. By the way, Jesus' return, remember, is not going to take place really until the world, the, 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 the nations are disciples, right? So that's still ahead of us. There's a work that's ahead of us. We need to support that work through our giving, through our prayers, through our involvement in bringing the gospel to whomever the Lord brings in our path. And we need to pray for opportunities to do that. Now, it means, fourth, that where there is greater light, there is also greater judgment. When that light is rejected, there's a reason why the Jews were judged so severely. They were the most privileged people on earth. God had separated them from all the nations of the earth, made His covenants with them, gave His laws to them, ceremonial laws, moral laws in particular that were meant to teach them of their need of His Son that had actually provided a means for them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ when the rest of the world was in absolute darkness. He sent His Son to them. And Jesus lived among them, walked among them, ministered among them for three and a half years, teaching and preaching and doing miracles. And yet they rejected Him. Now, that's the reason why, again, their judgment was so severe. And that's the reason why their judgment would be severe, not only in this world, but in the world to come. I think you probably noted uh, in our text, Jesus did say, how will they escape the judgments of hell? We read that, okay? It's not just the coming judgment that was going to be an earthly judgment upon that nation, but also eternal judgment. Our Lord Jesus said on one occasion it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment, Sodom and Gomorrah, those wicked cities, then for those cities that heard Jesus teaching and preaching and saw His miracles and yet rejected Him. That certainly applies to all of Israel, but He applied it in these particular cases to Capernaum and to the other cities in which, of course, He spent perhaps more time ministering. Where there is greater light, there is greater judgment. Now, we also need to understand that God has given to us and we have given to our children, right, uh, greater privileges. He's given that to us and to our children. That's the way it works within the Christian church. He's given us His Son. He's given us His gospel. He's given us His Spirit. He's given us His Word. So, the Lord has entrusted much to us and to whom much is entrusted, much is required. We need to make sure not only that we've received Jesus, that we've trusted Him, that we've repented of our sins and are following Him, we need to make sure that we are engaging in what our Lord has called us to do. We have a great responsibility, and that responsibility is really summarized in the Great Commission. We need to be about the service of our Lord because He takes these things seriously. 
So these are at least the, the initial lessons we're going to learn from this particular text, and certainly this is going to be a refrain as we go through this passage. I'm guessing it will take us perhaps another three or actually maybe two to four messages to get through this. But let's not forget these particular lessons. They, they are very important lessons. Our Lord wants, to, wants us to pay attention. He wants us to wake up out of any any kind of uh, illusion we might be under, any other idea that these things he doesn't take seriously. He, he does. There is more than just this life. There, are, there is more than just the things that we see around us. There is more than just preparing for the future, doing what we want to do through life, pursuing our careers or whatever it may be, preparing for retirement and so forth. There's the kingdom of heaven. There's the kingdom of God to advance in this world. Our Lord wants us to be involved in that. So we need to think about that, not only for our sakes, but for the sakes of those yet to hear. Let's take this seriously. All right, well, let's, let's pray, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us uh, do that. We've got to remember that uh, this is a great privilege as well, to be a part of the Lord's army. Remember the church militant. We are a part of the armies of the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> we are not in, in the church triumphant yet. We're not into that time of rest. Right now is a time of work, and we need to, to pray that God would help us do the very best we can do uh, in the work He has given us to do. So let's, let's pray that he might. 